Hello and welcome to episode number 31 of Zach's Tech Talk Tuesday. My name is Ryan McQueenie and on this week's show, I will be joined by a special guest to discuss some of the ins and outs of the cybersecurity industry. Today, I'm talking to Paul McGow, the founder and chief technology officer of Quiet LLC. That's spelled Q-W-Y-I-T. Paul is a telecommunications expert with over 35 years of experience handling financial, project management, database applications, and security systems. His firm developed Quiet Talk, a security as a service platform that allows any communications product to offer secure, private messaging through a simple connection to the platform. Simply put, it is a high quality product that helps other businesses lock down their messaging services. We didn't necessarily talk too much about Quiet or Quiet Talk on today's show, but I was able to chat with Paul about the history of cybersecurity and the progression of the industry throughout the years. We also discussed what types of companies and data are most at risk and whether individuals should trust anyone with their private information right now. Check it out. So before we get into the nitty gritty, I'd like to cover a few of the basics. Uh, We always hear about these massive data breaches and hacks, but I'm not sure that the average person really knows how this is going down on the ground level. Where are these attacks coming from? What type of information is at risk? And how the heck does it keep happening? Ryan, the the, the main thing to think about when you think about these attacks and that you hear about on the net, you hear, you know, cryptocurrencies for five hundred million dollars and Experian for for one hundred and forty million records. And I think just yesterday or the day before they announced, oh by the way, there's another two point five million records of people's data that was stolen. Um, these are these are organized, you know, we used to use the term organized crime and it meant the mafia. It what it really means is it means these aren't smash and grab jobs. These are organized attacks by, you know, whether whether it's foreign governments or criminal entities, et cetera. These are these are uh, groups that that get together and have a purpose for for you know either making money or doing you know some something that's a little bit uh, wrong with the data that they collect. So so they have to be organized. That's that's where they mostly come from. You know, you, you read about the one off of you know getting your identity stolen. And Ryan, by the way, I've had my identity stolen. And um, so so these the one off attacks are you know are just things the same as a stolen wallet. But these large ones are are organized efforts to to make those things happen. And the type of information, Ryan, it's anything that has value. So, you know, cryptocurrencies and financial data, social security numbers, um, all of those pieces of information that make you, you know, valuable to the world. They're not going to steal at you so so that they can go in and come and be on on your job, you know. We will kind of know that uh, you don't look like Ryan, you know, so when you show you, they're, they're not doing that. But they're stealing all the data that has value, and of course that's financial. And 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 the 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 things that they want to do with it is they want long term. They, like I said, these aren't smash and grab jobs. They don't want to just take your credit card and use it for the first hour that it might be available at the mall. They want to be able to get and become you for months at a time. So so the the type of information is definitely financial, personal, so that they can be you. And how the heck does it keep happening, Ryan? The reason it keeps happening, I, I, I'm reminded of a story that happened a couple of years ago. Um, the University of Maryland's graduate uh, 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 school was broken into. And you can imagine what's in personal student records. You know, there's all kinds of history there and financial data, addresses, you know, parents, sure. uh, social security numbers. It's, it's, you know, devastating data. And they interviewed the president, and he said, well, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, you can probably go on YouTube and find it. And he said, well, you know, it's kind of unfortunate because we just upgraded to the latest and greatest best practices for cybersecurity products and uh, procedures, and then we were broken into, so I guess we'll have to double our efforts. And, he, and I, I immediately thought, Ryan, does that mean we're going to use twice as much ineffective stuff or are we just going to try <laughs> twice as hard to put the ineffective stuff that we've got in more places? So the bottom line of how it keeps happening, Ryan, these systems are massive, they're complex, and they allow access. Organized efforts for doing this is all about getting there, being there, planning it, and then executing it. And executing isn't smash and grab. It's over time. It's over months. 
And so the reason it keeps happening is because people can get in there, they can stay in there, they can swim around in these large networks unsight, you know, unseen. That's how it keeps happening. Well, it's an interesting question that you pose, especially in that example um, where the school has has just recently upgraded. And I think this leads me great or leads me really well to the next question I have here, Um, because this is obviously something that has very slowly creeped into our national attention since the advent of the Internet. And especially since, you know, more things like um, personal finance and and, in e-commerce where there's there's more sensitive information on the Internet. Um, But in the grand scheme of things, all of this, uh, this, this idea of cybersecurity being an issue really is, is pretty new um, compared to some of the other uh, you know, security issues we might have in our everyday lives. Um, but you know, as we've kind of seen this uh, progress, what have we learned from these ota- attacks so far and what kinds of noticeable changes have been made in this industry? Well, the, the first thing that we've learned is it, everything's a pyramid, right? You know, the, imagine that, that iceberg and the Titanic, you know? Um, these are, when, when you hear about uh, 140 million records at Experian, um, it's the, the tip of the iceberg. That means right now, today, they're swimming around inside of networks doing other things in just as large a, an effort. So what we've learned is, is that, that these things are ongoing, they keep happening, and we try to move down the pyramid to get as much data as we can about, you know, how things are happening. So at the top of the pyramid, Ryan, would be something like, um, okay, the reason it happened is because the people who were, who were you know, tasked with uh, uh, keeping your data, you know, secure, they just thought if they locked the front door, everything's good, and that, you know, they don't need actual vaults and, and safety deposit boxes in the back. They can just put everything on the shelf, okay? So, so you, have, you have places that are being, you know, that were being attacked because they just weren't doing enough, okay? So, you know, so we move down the next level of the pyramid, and we say, okay, so now, now we've got, you know, um, the next level says, okay, these are people that are trying to do stuff. What have they tried? You know, where, where are they trying to patch these networks? Are they patching them from, from access through, you know, in, uh, uh, inside jobs? Or are these kind of all outside jobs? You know, so, so now let's go down the pyramid again and say, what do we need to do to tighten up the security for the inside job? You know, well, we need to do things like tie you to your identifier, your token. You know, it's not just that you can have an employee password and and uh, uh, username and password, Ryan. We've got to get you maybe a second factor. You know what I mean? We've got to get two factor, and that mm-hmm. we're not going to store that second factor. So we're pretty sure that Ryan had to be the one who logged in with that username and password. Somebody didn't just get it off the yellow sticky in front of you. You know, so so we learn. We move down the, the pyramid and we try to do okay. So if they're coming from the outside. Are they coming in from legacy systems? You know, is there an old system that somebody got and, and put some, you know, malicious code in that got access, you know, two, two months, three months down the road because they were purging or doing something with an old day? So, so you start to learn more about the ways that these systems can be an attack. But along with that, Ryan, as we're learning more and moving down the pyramid, now you have cryptocurrency exchanges. Those didn't exist five years ago, sure. right? You know? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so, 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 so as we go down the pyramid and we learn more about each phase of what's, what can be done and what's happening and what we need to do to provide either products or services or technology, we got, we, you know, we, all of a sudden we have to now apply it to do new and different places. And, and that's where the changes have been made is, is that the products that we're trying to build and the, and the, the, the protocols that we're trying to, to, you know, put in place for security access are, are, we're trying to make them better. There's a kind of a little asterisk, though, next to that, Ryan, is that some of the things I think that my industry is doing, the cybersecurity industry, are a little bit backwards, and, and I wish we were going in the other direction. An example of that is you, you have a new credit card, don't you, with the smart card on it? You know, yeah, the, the chip. The, the chip yeah, definitely. Sure, sure. So, so the way we used to process credit cards the magnetic stripe in the back, and it has some data, and you'd swipe it, and a couple of things would happen. You know, the reader would go and, and tr- process the transaction back, and the number of things that happen, I'm not going to get them right because I don't have it up in front of me, right in front of Google, but we're going to say it about anywhere from like four to six things happen. Well, now that we're doing the smart chip, we have about 10 to 12 things that are happening. Now, to me, that's going the wrong way. We need to go from four to six down to one to two. 
not not from four to six to ten to twelve. And the and so part of what we're doing, you know, the crypto security when, when we're trying to make these changes is some of the things that we're offering or whatever are getting more complex, and they're following the same, you know, they're they're making more access for for that organized criminal to be able to get inside. So so we have learned and we are applying and things are tightening up from a inside job perspective and things are tightening up from a, from some access places but in other areas we're, we're, we need we still have a lot of work to do. So is your basic premise there that uh, the more steps in the process the more opportunities there are for one of those steps to be uh, vulnerable to a mistake or a hack or an attack? Yes, and, and that's, that's well known. You know, we, we have a tendency, I was here, you know, in, in cryptography, and, and is that, you know, uh, uh, complexity doesn't equal, you know, security doesn't equal security. You can't, you can't just make something more complex and make it more difficult. That's like stenography, you know, where they try to put a, a symbol inside of a picture, Ryan. Have you heard about like, it? Uh, like cheat code puzzles. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Exactly. Just like that. And, and, and it's, it, no matter how you do it, it, you can kind of somewhat, at some level, you get down and you can tell the difference, you know, between mm-hmm. what it's supposed to be and what it's not. Okay. So, so obscurity just doesn't really work. And yes, that is one of my premises. And I, and the part of what we're trying to do with quiet is to go that other direction. Another example, along with the credit card one is TLS. TLS is that lock browser in your, you know, your browser and your server, HTTPS, right? You know that, right? Mm-hmm. So the TLS is the number one public, you know, worldwide crypto protocol. It's, it's, the, it's the places used everywhere. You know, you use a browser to go in here. And it's kind of replaced VPNs and, and a couple of other things. Certain companies and, uh, you know, uh, uh, organizations who have a lot of outside access you know, put a second layer of things. But a lot of people just use browsers and things to go in there. So TLS is, is there. It's been around for 22 years, and it still only has a 75% penetration rate. Right? And if you go to Google and type in, you know, how much traffic is going on the Internet and how much is security, it's around 75%. So in 22 years, we've only penetrated 75%. And, Ryan, part of that problem is because it isn't because TLS isn't a good protocol. It isn't a good way to, to you know, make sure that Ryan is Ryan when he connects through his web browser. It's that the performance is kind of slow. The methods we have underneath it that are being used inside of TLS, are, they're, they're reaching the end of their life. They're too slow. So the new version of TLS that's being put out today, they're, they're, it hasn't been changed in eight years. It's version 1.2, and it's being proposed, and it's called Zero Dash RTT, which is zero round trips. What they're trying to do, Ryan, is they're trying to extend how often you actually do parts of the TLS protocol from instead of doing it once per session, maybe now once every three sessions or five sessions. I think again. That's going the wrong way. We want to try to do. We want to try to authenticate you every transmission, right? Sure. So, so, so TLS is going the wrong way, and the reason it's going the wrong way, Ryan, is because they're trying to get more people to use it, trying to get from seventy-five percent up to a hundred percent, which is great. That's a great and worthy and noble goal. Unfortunately, we're kind of degrading the security to try to get there because we have secondary issues. So, our you know what I'm. What we try to do with Quiet is we're trying to go the other way. We're trying to do things that are more efficient, that are smaller, that you can do more often, because we think those are that's direction to go. That's to stop this. You know these massive and and uh, you know obviously costly invasions in these complex networks. You got to provide end to end security, and you need to do it with some some new types of methods. That's what we need. Right. Right. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. Um. Moving on a little bit here, I, I think we've started touching on this a bit, but I want to focus on um, some of the business that businesses that are really threatened um, by these breaches and these attacks that we've been talking about. Um, a few, obviously, that come up when I look at major figures, um, going to be industries like financial services and e-commerce. Can I trust all of these companies? Um, are they actually taking care of my information? Should I should I feel comfortable with these businesses? <laughs> right, in the, in the group of people I hang around with, we have we have a say. We go, let me think about it for a second. No, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> let me think about it. No, no, the answer is no. And now here's the thing, right? Okay, all of these organizations and companies realize that they have to trade off convenience for risk. 
Okay, there's no reason that Home Depot was, you know, lost 10 million records in their break-in a couple years back. Do you remember that 10 million credit card record? Yeah. Know? The only reason, the only reason Home Depot has them, they don't have them so that they can pay off their suppliers with your credit card. They have them so that it's convenient for you to click use my card, you know, and, right. and go to, so they're all of, all of these e-commerce and financial services are always trying to find a balance between risk, convenience the reward for the customer, because customer acquisition, this is a business, e-commerce and financial services, Ryan, they're in business, and customer acquisition and customer maintenance costs, they go through the roof, okay? And there's so much competition, et cetera. So they they try to balance those, and unfortunately, one of the places that they may cut corners is they may say, I think we're doing that good enough. Nothing's happened so far, so that's probably good enough. Let's just stay with that. And if you use that kind of attitude with, as we just discussed about all the new ways that there is to access, and, and you don't move down the pyramid of trying to learn what's happening and trying to put those new products in place. What you need to do is, Ryan, you should be diligent. So you can trust them, but you've got to keep track of your stuff, okay? When I, I mentioned before that my identity was stolen, really quickly, Ryan, the way they stole it is one of my credit cards was breached, but they didn't go and run to the mall with it. They did a change of address for $1 through the USPS. What they were trying to do was change my address, and they put it in for 20 days for just the first-class mail. Then they opened up four credit cards in my name, and then they were going to have them for 20 days. I would, Ryan, I wouldn't have even noticed my mail was missing, sure. right, because I'm still getting my junk mail. And was, so so the methods that, 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 that they, they can use is are are, you know, this wide, complex access, and it's up to you and me to be diligent about those things. So you can trust them, but don't store your credit card at the Home Depot. Type it in, you know, and and put alerts up on your credit card. I have alerts all over the place now, right? Nobody can use any of my accounts or any of my credit cards or whatever without me knowing, you know, and and do it all the way to the financial services, including Experian, et cetera. So, so you should trust in digital commerce. Okay, you have to. This is today's world. You need it. It it works. Okay, we're all busy. We're all doing things. So you need to to have confidence in it. But for trust, make sure that you participate just as much. Sure, sure, definitely. And I I, I think um, what's nice growing up in my, in my generation is that um, we we've, we've kind of all been aware of of the sensitivities of these issues almost our entire lives. So. Um, it feels yeah. like the things that we've been learning and the advancements that we've been making and the best practices that, um, that have come into the forefront of our attention have really been like as I've been growing up. So it's been definitely useful to learn as we go. And I want to kind of shift it. Uh, we, we, you were touching on this definitely. I want, I want to wrap things up here by asking one more question about how this works um, more from the the corporate level than uh, the individual level. Um, when we're talking about these companies um, that we're, we're kind of putting some trust into, whether it be a financial services company or e-commerce marketplace or whatever, um, are we seeing more activity from these companies in, in terms of um, supplying or purchasing or finding um, response services and, and kind of things that help them in, to respond to potential hacks? Or are we seeing people invest more in um, protective services? And I guess what I'm trying to get at, at there is, is there, a, is there maybe a problem with the way that companies are, are approaching it right now and that they're willing to wait and spend money on responding to the incident instead of, instead of investing in, in the protection? Yes, that's uh, 100% correct. I, I would say that, that that companies definitely respond too, too late. You know, when we talk about inside and outside jobs or whatever, Brian, these are, remember, this is organized activity, and it takes a while. It, it, uh, inside jobs and outside jobs have a different profile, and they have a different length of time. Outside jobs, access is generally somewhere between like 18 and 24 months. If you're talking about people have access and these crimes go on for that long period of time. Inside jobs are... 36 months and greater. So they're even longer because, they, you know, they go slow and they take more and do things. So, so companies' focuses aren't enough. On, and, and these things, you know, they happen so infrequently. And you always think just like, you know, an accident in your car, you think it'll happen to the other guy, not me, you know. And 
So, so companies are, are probably not doing enough in both regards, both protective and response, but definitely um, they're relying on their best practice, just like that president of the University of Maryland, on their protective services and saying we're doing enough. And then response is always a kind of catch as catch can, you know, let's grab it and try and put the genie back in the bottle. And so, so I, I think that there's definitely um, some room for improvement in both of those areas, but definitely in, in terms of response. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for your insights there and uh, for the rest of the the valuable insights that you've shared with us today. Um, Our audience is typically kind of individual investors. And what we've seen over the past over the past four or five years is um, security kind of explode um, into Wall Street and become, you know, one of our one of our most hot button kind of industries or sectors uh, to follow. And we have all these names and these tickers out that are, you know, publicly traded. Um, and I feel like they get lumped under this cybersecurity umbrella and a lot of investors don't really know what the product is or why the product is even necessary or how it works. Um, so to hear kind of more about the nitty gritty and how things are going on um, down on on really the ground level, um, I think is super helpful for for our listeners to, to really learn more about what they're investing in. So thank you for joining us. Um, Paul, it was a great talk, and uh, we hope to speak to you again soon. Ryan, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Investors interested in some different strategies in this industry should check out the First Trust NASDAQ Cybersecurity ETF, which is traded on the under the ticker Cyber, C-I-B-R, as well as the Pure Funds ISE Cybersecurity ETF, and that's traded under the ticker HACK, H-A-C-K. As a reminder, if you feel that we missed something or if you want us to cover a different story, feel free to shoot us an email at podcast at zax.com. Make sure to check out all of our other audio content at zax.com slash podcast. And remember to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. As always, thanks again for listening to the Zax Tech Talk Tuesday podcast. We will see you next time.